Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And, and guest. I'm Peter, too. I know. Isn't it great? Wait, you're Peter 3. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm <laughs> Peter Ill. I get to be pastor uh, in this cool place called Milstot, and my last name is Ill, which on the internet looks like the third. So yes, I don't know so, ha- how you guys are going to talk to me or about me, but I'm glad to get to be here. <laughs> and we're glad you're here with us as our special guest on this episode. We'll, we'll probably call you Pastor Ill. But, That's fine. You know, the, the Peter 2, Peter 3 joke was just too hard, too easy to resist, too hard to resist. How does that work? I don't know. Anyways, this is Crucial Conversations, a podcast of Crucial Productions, and we're glad to have Pastor Ill joining us today because we're going to talk about pastors. And so, you know, having a pastor on to talk about pastors, we thought was a good idea, right, Kevin? Yeah. (laughs) So we actually had a question come in from one of our listeners. Uh, John is his name. I'm not going to read the entire question, but I just want to give a little bit of a background of his question, kind of summarize it so our listeners can understand where we're coming from and where we're going with this episode. And by the way, this is probably going to be a two part episode because there's so much good stuff that we want to talk about in this. So uh, he, he says he has a question about how pastors are selected or called in the Missouri Synod, what kind of training they get uh, talks about finding a new church and what that looks like. So um, basically that's what we're going to talk about. Why pastors? Why do we have pastors? What does the call process in the LCMS look like? Uh, without going into what, what is it you said, Pastor Ill bylaws and reading bylaws? Yeah, the, policy, <laughs> procedure, and bylaws. Just it doesn't light anybody's fire, it, that's including really mine. Not co- yeah, not compelling podcast content. So we'll we'll talk about that without referencing those too much. Uh, pastoral formation, and then we're going to talk about how to pick a church. Uh, this John was somebody who has come to the Lutheran church from another uh, denomination. And he's like, Hey, I love the book of Concord. I read it. It's fantastic. I want to find a church that agrees with that. So he landed in the LCMS. Um, and you just want to talk about what is that? How, how do you guys pick churches? And once again, we're like, Hey, let's, let's have a pastor on to help us talk through that as well. So, Here's where we're going to start. Let's start with why pastors. And Pastor Real, I'm going to toss this one to you first as I facilitate our conversation today. Why do we have pastors? The easiest part of why we have pastors is because Jesus called disciples and he instructed that we would have pastors. Uh, In the Old Testament, we see that God set Aaron and his sons in order to be priests, to intercede on the behalf of the people of Israel before him, to bring sacrifices uh, for him. But now we see that in the New Testament, Paul is commanding Timothy and Titus not only to be pastors and do pastor stuff, but that they would establish pastors in the places where they were. I know that Titus was in Crete, and he was um, installing pastors there. But then we also get to recognize beyond the the really easy, because Jesus and Paul said so answer. I like that answer, but also because God's people need to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And so pastors are called to proclaim the love of Jesus Christ to the sinners that they encounter. Uh those centers are often within the church. And so the pastor isn't simply a church executive, but he is the one who is called to preach, to teach, to administer the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, to forgive sins, and to visit, especially those who are sick and dying, and to provide spiritual care for, uh, for those saints who gather there at, at that congregation and throughout the whole church. All right. I like that summary. All right, Dr. Kevin, what are your additional thoughts? Well, I think, I think that the first question is, is why do we need humans at all involved in this? This is a divine process. We believe in divine monergism when it comes to salvation. We say that God works alone to save us. And yet we say that this happens through humans. So I think the first thing we have to figure out is why are the humans involved at all? 
why aren't we kind of spiritually just zapped by the Holy Spirit or somehow have an, an inner warming of our heart that results in salvation or something. And and that's actually the the point is that when God interacts with humanity, he does so through means. And the first means as established in the scriptures is the actual word of God. So if you if you read and, and, and even the fact that it's it's reading the scripture is the the fundamental reality of God is the word that that he communicates with us through words. So revealed words in Holy Scripture, spoken words, heard words, it's all about words. God speaks in the creation, God speaks faith, he speaks his son, he speaks salvation, he calls forth from the grave, he makes promises. It's all about words. And when it comes to how that word is communicated then, humans need someone to tell them that word. We, we need to hear the word. We need to read the word. We need to understand the word. We need to believe the word. So fundamentally speaking, Christians need somebody to speak to them the word. Sinners need somebody to speak to them the word. The way the spirit works faith is through the proclamation of the word. So in, in a very fundamental level, um, pastors are word people. They're word givers. They're word proclaimers. Um, they're, they're word distributors. So in, in a very fundamental way, this is, this is how God interacts with people. So I, I have a question because when you said you started off by saying, why are humans involved in this at all? I think that's, that's a really good question because especially coming from my background, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about this today, but the role of pastor or the office of pastor within the LCMS is different than what I grew up with. It, it's not the same thing. Um, and we can talk, we don't need to talk about too much about what I grew up with, but one of the first things I thought of was first Timothy two, five. Um, I actually looked it up. So that's how I have the reference offhand here where it says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And so from that verse, that's usually one that gets referenced when we talk about what's the role of the pastor and the way in which you dis began describing it and in which Pastor Ill described it at the beginning. What does the pastor do? What is he there for? Somebody coming from my background would be like, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, no, no. There's one mediator between God and man. They'll quote this first. They'll go straight to it. Do You seem to be putting the pastor in the middle there. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this. Why are humans involved? Especially if somebody from my background is going to bring up that verse. How, how do we answer it in that way? Who wants it first? I, either one of you go. <laughs> I'll go. go when, whenever Kevin was talking before, whenever he was talking about pastors being word people, delivering the word of God, I think there's a really subtle and important uh, distinction there. Because every time Dr. Kevin said word, I was imagining word spelled with a capital W in my head. And I've gotten to hang out with you guys just enough to know that when Dr. Kevin says word, he means Jesus Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. When he talks about uh, word and word people and the means of grace, uh, he probably has lurking in there John 1.14, the word, that is Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. And so it is that first and foremost, God became man to do God-man stuff here among us. And so there's, there's no amount of spiritual zappitude that happens to make us uh, somehow holy uh, apart from the fact that God became man. It isn't that God calls pastors to be uh, magical or to have some kind of cool powerness to them, they are simply declaring what God has already declared. It makes me think quite a bit of what happens on Easter night. Uh, you know, in the morning, uh, the women had woke up. It was the first day of the week. Uh, it was still dark. They get to the tomb and they see that the stone is rolled away from the tomb. The body of the Lord Jesus isn't there. And they 
go back and tell Peter and John, they sprint to the tomb. Well, John sprints, Peter uh, shuffles or something. And they get there to the tomb and they look inside and they see the grave clothes lying there, but they don't see, uh, depending on which account you read, they don't see Jesus. In John, they see angels. Then Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. And later that night, Jesus shows up in the locked upper room where the disciples were. And he says to them first, peace be with you. Um, and they were afraid. And then he showed them his hands with the nail marks in them and his side with the spear wound. And he says to them again, peace be with you. And he breathes on them. And then they were glad when they saw that it was the Lord. And then he commanded them, uh, as the father has sent me, I'm sending you. Whoever repent, um, whoever's sins you forgive, their sins are forgiven them. Whoever does not repent and who you do not forgive, their sins are not forgiven. Or whoever sins you retain, their sins are retained. Uh, I realize I made a couple of uh, paraphrasing errors there because my memory is not so good. <laughs> but I, I got the main gist. We forgive you. Thank you. Uh, I am repentant for what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> But it is here that Jesus, the God-man, speaks to men who are certainly not God and declares to them authority, not because they're super-duper faithful. This is, remember, just a, just a day or two after Peter has denied Jesus three times after he said he wouldn't do that. This well, and, is, all, and every single one of them ran away, and this is still in the aftermath of them having run away entirely. So every single person in that room either denied as Jesus did or physically ran away from Jesus. And they haven't been, this is the first thing that happens after that. Yeah. Exactly. And so Jesus comes and he, he speaks to them that the father has sent them, or sorry, the father has sent him and he is sending them. Now he has put people in part of this divine monergism. And so divine monergism works through people, which I know, Peter, when you were kicking this off with uh, the verse of there's only one mediator between God and man, mm -hmm. and it seems that that if you have a pastor speaking with God's authority, that then, then that doesn't work. I still remember when I was a, a brand new puppy pastor, um, a Christian came to me, he, he wanted to sit down in my study and have this conversation. We sat down after exchanging some pleasantries and he said, pastor, I want to know, I want to know something. Where do you get off saying that you have the same authority that Jesus does <laughs> that you can forgive sins? And he said it with a smile. Um, oh yeah. yeah. Dear, dear Christian man. I, uh, I learned to have wonderful and fruitful conversations with him and, uh, and I dearly miss my conversations with him. And, but that question of how is it that a pastor can, with any level of authority, say, yeah, your sins are forgiven? That can be a very troubling thing. And the, the short answer is because Jesus showed up to his disciples and he said so. He, but he said so. Kevin's probably going to want to jump in on this too. When Jesus breathed on his disciples, it's a really interesting tidbit that John gives us in his gospel. Why in the world would Jesus breathe on his disciples? I think it's bigger than just so that the disciples would know what resurrection breath smells like. <laughs> as cool as that is. It's is that here. better or worse than morning breath? I think it's better. I um, hope so. I'm going to go with better. But <laughs> as Jesus comes and breathes on them, it's because in the beginning... On the sixth day, when God made Adam, he formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And Adam was made in the image of God. And here comes Jesus, risen from the dead, same God, and he breathes into the nostrils of the apostles the breath of life, the breath of Christ, risen from the dead, and gives them this authority. That is a powerful and faith-changing, world-changing event. And it's an event that has been passed along and given by the authority of Jesus for the good of Jesus' church. All right, so Kevin, I'm going to hand it to you next, but may, maybe you're already going here, but if in the process of 
responding to what Pastor Ill has said. How does that happening then get to our pastors today? So Pastor Ill said, hey, that actually applies to me. How do we get there that that actually applies to Pastor Ill on Sunday when he's speaking? Well, Unless you want to go in a different direction, feel free. <laughs> there's a couple of different things to think about in this. And the first is just stay in the book that Pastor Ill has been referencing, which is the, the best book of the New Testament, uh, <laughs> the Gospel of John. We knew that was coming some yeah. point in this podcast. I mean, exactly. it's, it's, it's a given. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is, the curious thing in the Gospel of John is that he spends a lot of time in the Gospel establishing authority that certain people speak with the correct authority and that authority is the very authority of God. And so when these people speak, their words have the same authority as God's word, which might sound a little weird, but it's true. It so does John, sound weird. <laughs> so John the Baptist is one who you can believe what he says is true because he's speaking in accord with God's will. And the second half of the gospel, Thomas speaks truth because he confesses the truth about Jesus when he says, my Lord and my God. The other thing that's established is that the scriptures are the words of God. So the Old Testament is the word of God, and Jesus' own words are equal in authority with the scriptures. So you'll see several times where it says they believe Jesus' word and the scripture. Okay, so those two things have equal weight. But hmm. then at the end of the book, this is what the author of the gospel himself says. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So now what that means is the apostle John believes that the words he writes are able to give saving faith to those who read and believe them. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, but if you th if you listen to that in the context of this conversation, what that means is that John believed he had the authority from God to represent Jesus. I'm just going to break in here because I've never had that thought. And once you led us right to that, I was like, wait, hold, hold on. That is huge. That is John huge. himself is actually making that claim. It's I look at that and say, well, it's the Bible making that claim, and and I, I see it in the con its authority in that context because that's how I see the Bible itself and and Scripture. But to to think of that next level of John himself is saying that, whoa, that's a little mind blowing. It really <laughs> is, and. And this is when people say, oh, do they know they're writing scripture or is this some kind of accidental? No, this was not accidental. John is saying the words that I have written have the authority to give you eternal life if you believe them. I mean, how in the world could you make that wow. claim as a human being? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> right. So so he has he has received from Jesus the Holy Spirit as Pastor Ill outlined in John chapter 20. And he now believes that that spirit is leading him to write these words and these words that the spirit is directing him to give to the church are life giving words. Okay. I love it when I have my mind blown on our own podcast. Isn't it fun? <laughs> it's like, wait, <laughs> we're, this is our podcast and I'm the one having my mind blown. Cool. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> so now as you have that in mind, go into Paul's writings when he says, I am writing to the, this to you as an apostle, which means the words that I'm speaking to you as an apostle have the authority of God behind them. Not just as in I'm right, but you can trust these words and thereby receive the grace of God because they are the very words of God himself. Okay, so now what we have is the apostles speaking with the word, the authority of Jesus. Okay, we see this in Acts chapter two with the apostle Peter preaching, right? So it's not just in written form, it's also in preaching form that this happens. Hmm. So the apostles are sent out by Jesus to speak and write his word. And when they do that, they have the same authority as the words of Jesus himself, meaning they can give eternal life. That's huge. Yeah. 
So then you think, well, those 12 die out, right? So then what do we do? Well, this is why Acts chapter 20, verse 28, which we talked about a couple of podcasts ago, or even last time, about how important this verse is with the, the Christology in it. But listen but listen to this now in the pastoral ministry. So the same verse that has good Christology also has important aspects of the pastoral ministry. Listen to this. Acts 20, verse 28. It says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now, wait a minute. These guys that he's talking to are the elders at Ephesus that Paul himself appointed as pastors over the churches there. And in this verse, Paul is actually saying that the Holy Spirit set these men up as overseers. Okay, that's our word bishop. And, hmm. and in some translations it says to shepherd the flock of God. And that's our word. Remember, pastor is simply the word shepherd. Okay? Okay. So in this verse... Paul's actually saying to the pastors of the church of Ephesus that the Holy Spirit put them in that position. So now you have John 20, where the Holy Spirit is breathed out on the apostles, and then you have the, the apostles giving this office to people, and they're saying, it's the same Holy Spirit that gives the same office to you. And, and what's common is not the person, it's not the attributes of the person, but it's the Holy Spirit in the word, right? So so this is truly a word office, the word of God in flesh in Jesus Christ. He gives that authority to his apostles. The apostles pass it on to the church and the office of the holy ministry. And it's also the authority of the word, the word proclaimed, the word of Christ proclaimed. So this is the Holy Spirit's office to proclaim the word is those who speak in the same authority as the apostles, that is to stand in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now now you've you've made a move here that I want to pause on. And and Pastor Ill, I'm gonna toss this one to you first because as you were going through, here it is Jesus to his disciples. Paul as an apostle to the pastors in Ephesus, the first thing that came to mind for me is the the concept of apostolic succession. Uh, Good. The the idea of the laying on of hands in the pastoral office passed on from one person to another in an unbroken chain all the way back. And there are church bodies today where that is a very significant part of their confession. The Roman Catholic Church, that's essential um, Episcopal Anglican communion. I know that's that's a, a big deal there. I, I there's probably others. The oh, Eastern Orthodox, Orthodox churches. Yeah, I was gonna say Orthodox, definitely. The, so as you started describing that, I'm like, okay, that's why apostolic succession, laying on of hands, great, that's necessary. And then I'm thinking, but in the LCMS, we don't see that as necessary. We don't actually go that same route. We kind of make a different move. And I also know we're not the only ones who make that different move. What are, what's going on there? <laughs> I want to back up and take a running through, start. Was, yeah, great. Dr. Kevin laid out wonderfully that the, the office of the Holy Ministry or, or the pastoral office is at the same time Christological and Christocentric. If it isn't given by Jesus, then it doesn't do anything, and it's not any good. And so the the office is given to us by Jesus to speak with Jesus' authority. Really big deal. And it is always focused and emphasized on proclaiming the one who gave the authority, that is, Jesus. If the pastor is not talking about Jesus, then, then we have a problem. So when it comes to how it is that pastors are made and if apostolic succession is necessary, it comes down to, is this person called by the gospel and is this person set aside to to speak in line with the apostolic faith? It's not that the person needs to be traced back to uh, having their origin 
um, through the pastor who ordained uh, me to the pastor who ordained him to the pastor who ordained him. It's not about any kind of a flow chart or an ordination family tree uh, that goes all the way back to, to say, one of the apostles or to Peter himself. But really it comes down to, does this person speak with the authority of Christ? Think about when we confess in the uh, in the Apostles' Creed, we talk about believing in the uh, in the apostolic church. That's not that we trace ourselves all the way back to the apostles because they were super cool guys. It's that we trace ourselves back to the teaching that was given to the apostles and that they proclaimed. It's about the teaching. It's about the call of Jesus, and it's about that Christocentric and Christological. Uh, approach that we've been given, not about uh, who is it who ordained me, because ultimately it is Jesus who has called pastors to speak with his authority, not the guy who laid hands on me. <laughs> okay, so I I like doing that. I like talking about Jesus. I like proclaiming Christ. Based on what you just said, oh, I can just like hang up a shingle and call myself a pastor because I've I, I'm I'm faithfully teaching, or I think I am, or I'm going to do my best to faithfully teach what the apostles taught, faithfully confess that. Great. I'm a pastor now. Is that how that works? Well, are you qualified according to the guidelines that are laid out in Scripture, especially in First and Second Timothy and Titus? And have you been called by a congregation in order to speak to them with the authority of Jesus? Uh, I know I haven't on the second one. I don't know about that first one. I have to guess I have to look that up. Okay. Um, it, <laughs> but this, and, this is part of the question about pastoral formation. How do we get pastors? Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is something that I get to visit about with the people in my congregation fairly often, because sometimes they'll look at me and they'll say, we're so glad that you, that you went to seminary and can be our pastor. And, and I take a deep breath and I smile and I say, but it's not because I came to seminary that I get to be a pastor. If I would have gone to seminary and got my cute little degree, uh, I shouldn't call it cute nor little. Um, <laughs> it took a lot of time and a lot of work. But I could have gone and done the work, put in the time, and had it, no congregation extend me a call. I wouldn't have been a pastor. I couldn't have just gone out and started doing pastor things Pastors are ultimately uh, recognized, you could even say made, by the church of Christ who calls them to be the word of God guy there in that place. And so it's not that uh, that I've taken this upon myself, but a particular congregation uh, saw some paperwork about me. They, they drove up, they visited me, and they said, hey, not only do we want you to be a pastor, we want you to be our pastor. And so I was ordained at that church, set aside to, to be a word of God guy there in their presence. Uh, after a few years, a different congregation uh, saw my paperwork and said, hey, we want you to be the word of God guy here. And I took some time. I got to pray and consider, talk to uh, people that I trusted in all kinds of different situations. And and I moved from being the Word of God guy in one place to being the Word of God guy in another place. But that's probably a whole different podcast episode right there. <laughs> uh, Kevin, what, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? I, I have another question, but I want to hear your thoughts first. Okay, so we pivoted over an important part of this discussion, and Pastor Ill mentioned this at the very beginning when he talked about Aaron and the priesthood is that the priesthood that God gave to Israel in order to do the mediation between him and his people was fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And just as that priesthood was given, not just to specific, the specific priests in the old Testament, but also to the whole people of Israel in Exodus. So also in the new Testament, the fulfillment of the priesthood to the church is actually the church itself and an individual office. So that when we speak about the priesthood of all believers, what we mean is that every person who is baptized into Christ receives the role 
of proclaiming Christ to the people in their lives. Specifically, we think of in the home. We think of proclaiming Christ to unbelievers whenever we have the opportunity. We think of sharing Christ with one another. But every single person in Christianity, every Christian, everybody who's baptized into Christ is a priest. They pray for one another. They teach one another the word of God. They proclaim Christ whenever the opportunity comes. Um, when we think about this, Luther actually uses Stephen in the book of Acts as an example of this, as someone who was not called into the office and yet was able to proclaim Christ to unbelievers. Wait, Stephen wasn't a pastor? Right. Honestly, I mentally, I think of him as a pastor every time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was a deacon. <laughs> okay, so what's what's the difference then in, in that? So he's not an apostle, and the apostles did not appoint him to the office of preaching. He actually appointed him to the office of waiting but on tables. But every time Stephen does something in the you book of Acts, you can get stoned for waiting on he's tables. He's preaching, no. and he's giving an <laughs> apologetic and a reason for for why he believes, knowing what he believes and why he believes it, knowing the faith in order to pass it on. That's the work that Stephen is doing, even though he was uh, he was called and established to be a deacon. Uh, waiting on tables and caring for the needs of the poor, he ended up speaking the gospel. I'm I'm still concerned because I was a waiter as part as like my first career. Now I'm learning you can get stoned for waiting on tables. I'm I'm kind of he got about stoned that. for confessing Christ. <laughs> ah, it wasn't okay. the waiting on tables that got him stoned. <laughs> it was the confessing Christ part. <laughs> so you also confess Christ, which means that you might well get persecuted for it. And Jesus sure. talks about that and gives us comfort in that reality. Uh, so it's not the waiting on tables. It's the confessing Christ. But that's exactly what Jesus calls us uh, to do. Oddly enough, I'm more comfortable. I'm actually okay with getting rocks thrown at me for confessing Christ. It's, it's the waiting on tables that bothers me. Why would you do that? I suppose that's a good thing then, that, that the correct one bothers me. So... What this means then is that when we talk about the pastoral office and the specific people who are called to fill the pastoral office is that these individual, these men are called from the priesthood of all believers. So the first qualification to be a pastor is that you need to be part of the priesthood of all believers, a baptized believer. And the, the example of the New Testament, as well as the call of Jesus, is that he calls certain men from the church to serve the church in this specific role of the proclamation of the word and the administration of the sacraments. So the pastoral office is not the fulfillment of the Aaronic priesthood. That's fulfilled in Jesus, right? Okay. And the priest of all believers is given to the whole church just as it was given to ancient Israel. But the, the role of specific men called to proclaim the word to the church and to the world is then given to what we call the pastoral office or the office of the holy ministry. So in the book of Concord, it says, in order that the salvation may be delivered, God has given us the office of preaching or the office of the word. And, and this is really the point is that the whole reason the pastoral office exists, the reason pastors exist is because of the death and resurrection of Christ as God's action to save mankind. This action is given to people, that the benefit that Christ won on the cross is given to people through the proclamation of the word. And the office of the holy ministry is the office through which that is done publicly for the church and for the world. Okay, so Pastor Ill you're in that office. As you hear that, what does that look like for you as a pastor serving publicly, serving your church, serving God's people? I'm going to pick today as, as my day um, to talk about. It was, kind <laughs> of, it was kind of an interesting and exciting day. It started off with I got to get up early and make some, some final preparations for a funeral then I got to comfort a family with prayer uh, before they received friends and family uh, to share their grief at, at a time of death. Then I got to stand up and proclaim that Jesus Christ has overcome death. Uh, 
that's something that this family knows well, but it's something that today was a good day to remind them of because there had recently been a death in their family. And then I got to go to the cemetery and say again that Jesus has overcome death. I got to have lunch and pray a little bit more with some folks, uh, speak with some members of my congregation who, who were talking about the number of funerals that we've had recently, or we, we've had quite a few and we're kind of down uh, about it. And so it was a good opportunity to speak about the comfort that Jesus brings, that he has really overcome death. Then I got to uh, visit with somebody and pray before they go in for surgery. Then this evening I got to uh, lead another church service, talk about how it is that we are baptized into Christ, that uh, that baptism and the purification that it brings is a way that Jesus has blotted out our sin. Uh, and now And now I get to be here. So all through the day, it's been an awful lot of conversation about how it is that, that Jesus has overcome the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature and flesh to know that this is all about what Jesus is doing. Um, I sure don't want people looking at me. I'm not much to look at, and, and I don't make for a very good example. But Jesus is the one who comes and says, you, Christian, are made holy and pure by me, even as the guy who tells you about me is made holy and pure and perfect by me. And so one of the things that Dr. Kevin said that is just really important and helpful is that Christians, uh, when, when Christians uh, call someone from their midst, from that priesthood of believers to be their pastor, they call somebody who is first and foremost a Christian. Um, it's not that pastors are somehow different or holier or specialer than, than anybody else. They simply are Christians who are called by the church, who uh, speak and teach with Jesus' authority, because Jesus said so. Now, now it's interesting as you went through the, thing, the things you did today. Some of those things I hear and I say, oh, well, I could do that. You know, just as as me as a lay person, some of that speaking, some of that giving comfort, there there are certain ones of those where I'm like, okay, I could do that. There's others where it'd be really, really weird if I got up and did that because I'm I'm not a pastor. Now I recognize that where I'm at now is is how, why I see that as weird for me. If I were to get up and do that, it'd be weird. But there are people who come from different traditions who maybe have become Lutheran or they're looking, they're considering, you know, is that the right church for me? Where, where am I coming? Who They don't come from that background. And maybe they come from a background where kind of anybody can do that. Or maybe there's a few people who can, but it's a pretty broad group that could jump in and, and take part in that. How, how would you talk and Pastor Ill, how would you talk to somebody in that situation and begin walking them through the difference from where they're coming from to where they are now? And I think we're probably going to end up wrapping up the podcast with this question, or part one at least. Um, Dr. Kevin's actually experiencing technical issues, and he has now departed. <laughs> um, so w- walk through it as we're, as we're closing out the podcast. Walk through how would you begin to help somebody understand the the difference there and and beginning to see to see that i guess that's a really about all i could say <laughs> if somebody comes in and understands what pastors are and what pastors do in a different way or who says anybody who can talk about jesus can do so uh, publicly or privately. And this is where, uh, in the history of the church, sometimes uh, that pastoral office has been called the office of the public ministry. And that can be kind of a confusing term because sometimes the work that pastors do in that public ministry kind of a way is done one-on-one or in private. Uh, for example, individual confession and forgiveness is something that's done between a sinner and the pastor, and nobody else is to know about it uh, as far as what's confessed there. Uh, 
But that's where the pastor speaks on behalf of the church. So when you hear the pastoral office, or when you hear about the office of the holy ministry or the office of the public ministry, that is that the pastor isn't just speaking as as someone within the priesthood of all believers, but the pastor is speaking in such a way as saying, I speak on behalf of the whole church, and I speak on the behalf of Jesus. And so when I got to go and comfort a Christian before their surgery that's coming up tomorrow, um, I, I ended it by saying, I would like to give you a blessing that comes, uh, that's drawn from scripture. It's not something that I just made up. It's not like Pastor Ill's well wishes for, for a, a good surgery tomorrow, but to give you something drawn from scripture that is a blessing from God, uh, through me as pastor on behalf of the church. And the person looked at me and they said, say that again. So I did. And then they said, yeah, I want that. <laughs> and so I got to give this Christian a blessing speaking with the authority of Jesus on behalf of the church for the good of that Christian. And Lord willing, I'll get to go on Wednesday and see this Christian after their surgery and give them another different blessing uh, about God's word for them and God's comfort for them. I, I think you you hit on something really important, and maybe this is where we'll we'll wrap up here. But I think that's partly why it seems so weird to me to 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 even think of stepping in and doing some of those things because there there is a peculiar, specific, particular comfort that comes when my pastor, who has been given to me by God to speak God's word to me, does that. And, and while there is always comfort when another Christian can speak God's word to me because it's God's word, when my pastor speaks those words to me because God has told him to, I mean, I guess this maybe that's the proper way where we can actually say that. Um, feel free to correct that. I'm totally okay if you need to correct that. Um, there, there is a peculiar specific comfort that comes from knowing this is the man that God has placed to speak these words to me. And it, and it's, these words are for me. And he's, he's the one who has been given to speak Christ and Christ's words to me. And if I go to speak somebody else, okay, I, as the priesthood of all believers, I can speak God's word. I can give that comfort, but I can't add that. This is what God has given me to do in the same sense. It does. does. Sense? I want to give a, a small, really helpful caveat though, that goes like this. Yeah, um, please. Pastors are indeed called by God, by Jesus, to speak with Jesus' authority. But they are also called through Jesus' church to exercise that authority. And so it's not enough just yeah. to say, I think I would be a good pastor and I know that God has called me to be a pastor, but rather the church calls pastors. Uh, you asked before if you could just hang a shingle and go do pastor stuff. And the answer is no. Uh, pastors are called by Christ's church, from Christ's church, to go be pastors, to fulfill that office and to get to do that, that good work as it gets called in 1 Timothy. Uh, and it is a good work, a work prepared by God. But that doesn't mean that it's magical or that it's something that you can take on for yourself. Are these people called by God with for Christ's authority to serve the church? Yes. But they're also called by the church with, with prayer and consideration. And that's probably a good place for us to, to take a break. And then next time we'll get to pick up there. In a, in a nutshell, 30 seconds, what is that message that pastors are called to speak Pastors people. get to be the word of God guy. They declare that Jesus is God made, who is God and man at the same time who came to this world to overthrow the devil, to conquer death, to undo and remove sin, to make you holy. And then he comes and he declares that, but he doesn't do it in some kind of an abstract, disconnected way. He shows up speaking through a broken, sinful guy who does things with water and bread and wine and 
puts his hands on you and speaks the forgiveness of God. And we have certainty and faith, not in the work of that guy, but in the word of Christ, because it is with the authority of Christ that he does these things for the church. And speaking that word of Christ to each other, that is the crucial conversation. Pastor Ill, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. We will have a part two. And in part two, uh, maybe that'll be next week. I don't know. Depends on (laughs) when we coordinate our schedules. We're going to talk about pastoral formation um, within our particular tradition, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. We're going to talk about how how to pick a church. Now that we've got some of this background of why pastors, what are pastors for, what do they do, what do they speak, we'll begin getting into some of that, how do I become a pastor and if I'm a lay person, how do I pick a church? Where do pastors come um, from and I'm how do I get one? Con- oh, there you go. That's a great way to phrase it. Cool. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation. I'm sorry, Kevin's internet did not enjoy the conversation and decided to quit on him. And that's why he doesn't get to wrap up with us. But hey, this question came in on our website. You can go there, crucialproductions.org, and click the Ask a Question button at the top menu there, or send a question directly via email, questions at crucialproductions.org. Um, those are two of the best ways to get to us. You can reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're, we're in all the places. You can even post a comment on YouTube, and we'll see those and respond to them as well. But thank you, those of you who are listening. Once again, Pastor Ill, thank you for joining us, and look forward to talking to you Me next too. time. All right. Good night, everyone. Or good morning. Good day. Goodbye. That.